Hi friends and welcome to another episode of Piano TV. So today I wanted to do another tutorial with you guys. This one's good if you're a relative beginner, if you've been kind of playing somewhere in that like six months to one year range. It's a nice simple tune that also has like a few complex elements. So it's not like completely basic like A, B, C's or anything like that. Anyway, the song I'm talking about is from the New World Symphony by Anton Dvorak. And it's from the second movement, the Largo movement. And it's a really famous piece. It's probably one of the most famous symphonies. I don't know. I, I just kind of made that up, but I'm assuming it's a really famous symphony. So as always with our, with my tutorials, uh, you can click the description thingy down below and find the link to the PDF if you want to print it off or use it on your tablet or whatever crazy media devices people are using these days. <laughs> All right, so backstory time. The full title of this symphony is the Symphony Number no. 9 in E Minor from the New World, Opus 95. And most of us can just refer to it as the New World Symphony. The symphony was composed at the end of the 1800s by a guy named Antonin Dvorak, who was of Czech origin. And the entire symphony is about 40 minutes, so it's quite the ride. If you want to listen to it, I'll link it in the accompanying blog post, which you can find below if you like want to see the whole thing. So what we're learning today is just a, a small fraction of the entire piece, like maybe like a one minute chunk of the whole puzzle. Dvorak wrote the New World Symphony while he was living in New York. He spent a few years in the United States, and he spends most of his life over in Europe, but he was really influenced and inspired by Native American folk music, and that's one of the major influences he drew from for this piece. So maybe maybe you'll hear like a little bit of folk music elements when we hop on the piano and take a listen. All right, so just a quick note before we get going with this here. So I changed the arrangement a little bit because this piece was originally written in the key of D flat major. And since we haven't really done key signatures with five flats yet, I figured I'd just simplify it and transpose it down a half step to the much simpler key of C major. And I know it's in C major because by looking at the key signature, there's no sharps and flats. And if you look at our first chord, C, E, G, that's a C chord. So there's all your indications that this is in C major. All right, so now breaking it down into smaller components. So we have the Italian Largo, which means slow. And having listened to it, you probably, you know, you know that it sounds slow just from listening to the arrangement. At the very end of the song, we have another Italian word. So rit, which is short for ritardando, and that just means to gradually get slower towards the end here. There are lots of dynamics in this piece, and that's that's one of the keys to playing it properly. So you start with like a soft volume, but then in the second line here, you see you have these crescendos and diminuendos, crescendo, diminuendo. So really, really watch, even right from the beginning when you're learning this piece, that you keep it super expressive. And then the third line, you can see there's even more of that. There's like a much uh, more dramatic crescendo and decrescendo here. So just that's something to keep in mind right from the beginning. Just remember that music, it, it doesn't exist on a flat plane, so it should be three-dimensional sounding. I know I know it's kind of abstract, but that's what paying attention to things like dynamics or, you know, other things like, like phrasing right here, or if there's articulations like staccatos and stuff like that, that's what that brings to a piece. It just brings more dimension to it. 
At the very end, we have this kind of like squiggly symbol that we haven't done before. Now this is called an arpeggiated chord, kind of like an arpeggio. Actually, this is an arpeggio going on in the left hand right here. So I like to think of an arpeggiated chord as imitating like a harp or a guitar. So if you're playing guitar and you just kind of like gently roll your thumb from the top to the bottom of the strings, you get this kind of like dang a dang effect. I, I can't say, I'll show you on the keyboard in just a second here. But that's the effect you want to get on piano. You don't want all the notes to be pressed all at the same time. You want it to kind of roll from the, from the bottom to the top. So let's hop on the keyboard and I'll show you what that looks like. So here's the look at that arpeggio. The left hand is playing C, G, C, and then the right hand is playing E, G, C. So you want to think of like kind of like the rolling from the top of the guitar to the bottom of the guitar. So that's what the effect would look like in slow motion. Okay, so you don't want it to be like really crazy rapid, but you want to kind of like find a, an in-between point between those. So I, I would usually go like... It's like a nice gentle roll. And you'll notice that I'm not lifting up my fingers as soon as I roll them. So you don't want to do this. Yeah, that doesn't quite have the same like, I don't know, like pretty sustained effect. So you just kind of like gently roll into them. This is something that you should just like sit down and play around with because you'll, you'll feel when it's right. You'll hear the sound. But yeah, just make sure that once you press a finger, it stays held down. And that'll give it that nice sustain. All right, so let's spend a minute here talking about the rhythm because we have this like dotted eighth and sixteenth note combo going on here. And if that's something that like looking at, you're like, what is going on there? I encourage you to check out a video I did just solely dedicated to these dotted notes. And I'll link that here on the screen right now just in case you missed that. But otherwise, we'll just do like a really quick review here. So the first thing you want to do, since we're in 4-4 time, is you want to go and find all four beats in this bar. So this is going to be the first beat, this is going to be the second beat, this is the start of beat three, and this is the start of beat four, okay? So since we have smaller units, like eighth notes and sixteenth notes, I want to subdivide this further, because if we count one, two, three, four, that's a quarter note beat. So let's break it down into an eighth note beat. So that would be one and two and. So the and kind of like falls somewhere in the middle of this, so I'll put it right there. Two and, and then same thing, the three and kind of falls in the middle, and then four and at the end. All right, so now we have an eighth note unit. And I still don't think this is sufficient enough. I want the 16th note unit so that we know exactly where to play this, this guy right here, the 16th note. So to divide one and two and three into 16th notes, we go one E and a two E and a three E and a, I don't know why the E's and the A's other than kind of just rolls, oops, kind of just rolls off the tongue a little easier. So this one right here, this G, lines up with a. Uh. So if I were to clap this rhythm and count it, just so you can kind of hear how it goes, I would go one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a. All right, does that kind of make sense? And I like doing the one E and a instead of just like doing one and two and, cause it just, it makes, it makes it more exact because it, otherwise you're just kind of like guessing where that beat. If you go one and two, and it just more is left to the imagination guesswork, and I'd rather be really precise with rhythm. I haven't indicated any fingering marks on the sheet music. So what I want you to do if you're learning this piece is I want you to figure it out on your own. And if you have any, what I usually do if there's no fingering is I'll just jot down maybe key fingers, like maybe the one that I start on. So maybe you're like, oh, I should start on finger three here. And then any parts that might be confusing that you might not do the same each time might be worth writing in. So maybe right here I would be like, okay, I got to make sure I get my thumb and finger three going on there. And if you print this off, I, I really encourage you to just jot down little finger markings for reference. In general, what our goal is in this song, and, and this, this makes it actually quite difficult, and this makes the fingering choices pretty important, is you want to have smooth phrases. So you want to play these slurs without lifting to the best of your ability. So make sure your finger choices are logical so that you could play the this pattern without having big jumps in your fingers. The one part of this piece that, that it's actually quite tricky is where you have these left hand parts where you jump from quite a like a high C chord to a much lower two notes, the E and the C. So I'll show you that on the piano and we can kind of take a look at how I do the fingers for that and keep it smooth. Because 
what what sometimes happens it's tempting to throw in the pedal with a piece like this because pedaling can create the effect of legato but i want you to try to play this one without the use of pedal to see if you can really actually keep it smooth without it because Pedaling is meant to enhance a piece, not to be a crutch for it, okay? So sometimes I think it's really good practice to, yeah, just play without a pedal to work on that legato tone without any extra help. So let's look at the piano on how I might accomplish that. Just to look at some fingering choices on the piano here, I want to show you the first line where the left hand goes from these notes to these to this. And it's expected to do in like one slur, one smooth motion. So that can be kind of tough because play this and then it's like you gotta do like a really awkward finger maneuver to get here so this is where instead of using the typical hand shape here's a fifth using finger five and one I'd actually use five and two because that frees up my thumb to stretch a little higher for the next set so watch this see how it just kind of like falls into place there it's a little bit of a stretch between these two fingers but that's how you can create that smooth sound and then that last E is just a simple walk down from the thumb. So there's another part in the third line where the the left hand is doing a lot of work. So the left hand is doing something that looks like this. Where the top note holds, but the bottom two notes need to be smooth. And this is the same idea. Instead of using this like typical 5-3-1 shape, lifting and having like a pause. Ooh, there's a police. So instead of using that typical 5-3-1 shape and then having like a, a noticeable lift, again, we're trying to create slurs here. So I'm going to switch up my fingering a little bit. I'm going to do 1-2-4. Hear, hear that? It's, it's much more smoothly connected. Of course, it's much more difficult to do. And you might find that your fingers aren't coordinated like that at first, but it, it's really worth practicing. It's good uh, coordination skills and learning how to do like nice smooth legatos on the piano is crucial. There's another set in that third line, but this one's simpler because we only move one note. So again, instead of that one, three, five shape, we do that one, two, four. And just kind of like move from four to the pinky there. So there's, there's several spots in the song where I want you to look at the kind of like the weird slur patterns and see if you can figure out a logical fingering pattern to do it. In this piece, we have our very first cluster chord going on here. And I, I actually think it's our first four note card. So this is the second measure of the song and you play C, D, F, G, kind of all smushed together at the same time. I know it kind of looks like they're side by side just because of the way they're written, but that's kind of how you have to no write two notes that are like squished together. Otherwise you'd like have them overlap and then it just looked like a big ball and it wouldn't make any sense. So that's what a cluster chord looks like. And basically all a cluster chord is, it, it's not like a real chord in the sense that it's not like a major chord. It's not a minor chord. It's not a seven chord. Um, it's just kind of like some random notes lumped together basically. So just a little quick chord theory review here. So in any key signature, you have two chords that are just super important. And I mean, there's other chords that are important too, but if I was like, I don't know, at knife point, I had to pick two chords that were really important, I would pick the tonic chord, which is like the first chord of a key. So if we're playing in the key of C major, a C major chord would be the first chord, right? Because it's the first note of the scale. So that would be one really important one. The other one would be a G chord, which is sometimes known as a G7. And that you can kind of see over here, and we mark that with the Roman numeral V for five, because if you think about G major scale, G, D, E, F, G, they're five notes away. So that's the first chord, that's the fifth chord. And since this is not G, B, D, which is just a regular G major chord, this is actually G, D, F, adding that F there, that turns it into a seven chord. So we got like our V7. And if you just kind of, if you just kind of scan through the song, you'll notice that there's quite a few I's and V7's going on in this piece. Here's another I, here's another V7. So just look through and see how many of the chords you can actually identify, because most of them you should know, even if they're in different spots. Now, if I had to pick a third most important chord, which I will, just just because, I would pick this guy. And this guy goes for the entire line. And this is an F major chord. So if you think about what Roman numeral we should put under there, if we're in the key of C major, F is four notes away, C, D, E, F. So we would put the Roman numeral four for that chord. And you can kind of see it just repeats over and over again in here.
The fifth chord is sort of like our point of tension where the first chord is like our home base, which is like our, our relief note. The fourth chord, it, it doesn't really sound very tense, but its function is more to like serve as a stepping stone between chords. It's, it's kind of like more of a transitory type chord. So that that's its role. And no matter what key you're in, you'll find these harmonies used like 95% of the time, especially, um, especially, you know what, not even especially classical music because radio music features these chords heavily too. So I wanted to just make one more mention here of split voices. So in the third line, you have something kind of crazy where you have a note in the left hand where the stem's going up and then a couple notes where the stems are going down. So usually in simpler piano music, we just have two voices, right? We have the left hand part and then we have the right hand part. And each hand kind of plays like just one voice. It's like if you were imagining two people singing or something. Now what's happening here is the left hand is actually splitting in two. So this part right here has three voices because you have this like top half note situation going on. That'd be like, I don't know, like one or two people sing. I don't know if you've ever been in choir or anything like that, but this would be like the part that the alto would sing and then the bass guys would sing these very low notes at the bottom. And then the soprano might sing these parts right here. Oh, I think I messed that up. I think it'd be tenor doing these ones and then be, it's been a long time since I've been in choir. And that's all for today's video. As I mentioned earlier, if you wanna learn how to play it and find the sheet music, it's all linked to below. You can just follow the links, follow the yellow brick road and uh, have fun with that. Another thing I just wanted to mention is that if you haven't already read it, I've written a 32 page ebook on how to practice the piano. Um, I've made it available for free. So if you wanna kinda learn piano, maybe in a little bit more depth or that's something that interests you, definitely check it out and I will catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Hi friends and welcome to an episode. Uh <laughs>